Good evening. This is the September edition of Operation City on the Hill. I'm your host, Robert Maynard. Now, up in, in the first couple sections of this series, first couple of shows we had, we were talking, started out talking about the amount of change that we're in and the, there's been a backlash, a populist backlash. And I think the jihadi movement is part of that populist, populist backlash to modernity and the change is associated with the digital age and modern age. I think some of that, um, some of it is just scared because you know, there's a lot of change that scares people. But some of it, I think, we may be pursuing a model of modernization and globalization that, that um, undermines local sovereignty, that, that it undermines individual initiative and creativity. And we're living in an information age when there's things happen so fast, it's hard to regulate people's behavior by government bureaucracy and especially if you deal with if you think you're going to have peace by political fiat and global political organizations it probably is you you're, you're going to undermine sovereignty and i think um this is something we mentioned that the james madison when you talked about it was a jean jock result had a proposal like this a global parliament of nations that would um, act as kind of a quasi-world government to bring peace among nations. He didn't think that would work. So we were talking about the alternative and how this might work better in terms of bringing people together but at the same time allowing individual creative. And it's, I want to go into the example of the struggle for freedom and equality that we had in the 19th century that was created what was termed the voluntary way. In other words, we're going to try to create a society where human interaction is characterized by voluntary associations rather than government bureaucracy. Now, after the Declaration of Independence went out to the world, and then we, there was a revolution, we started this new nation in the eyes of the world upon us, and we wanted to create this city on a hill, hence the title of the show. You got a problem. You got slavery. You got the unequal treatment of women. You got all kinds of, you, you got disparity between the haves and have nots. So you, you got a struggle to flesh out the content of we hold these truths to be all men, these truths to be self evident. All men are created equal and endowed by the Creator by the certain inalienable rights. Among them are life, liberty, and so they're tri pursuit of happiness. How, you you got to have justice if you're going to have happiness, and you certainly can't have slavery. So you, there was a struggle, and I think the key movement in this struggle was the abolitionist movement. But a lot of your early abolitionists were also part of what they call a peace movement. They they Quakers were, played a huge role in that. And that's why tonight I want to focus upon the the. Um, thinking of the Quakers and what driv, drove them to take the role that they had in the early abolitionist movement. They, outside of the um, escaped slaves in the black churches, the Quakers played the um, prominent role in the early abolitionist movement. We talked earlier about the difference between the old order and the new order, a new order for the ages. And they were, they were, um, just opposing their vision of a new order for the ages or as a city on a hill against the old order where might makes right and justice according to Plato, uh, played the character in Plato's Republic, the sophist Thrasymachus, is justice is the advantage of the stronger. Where did this idea come from? In pre-biblical times, human beings were seen as simply a phenomena of nature. And you, the laws of nature the, you know, the, the, the gazelle doesn't claim human rights violation when the lion eats them. That's just the laws of nature, the, the laws of the jungle, kill or be killed. And hence, justice is the advantage of the stronger. If we're merely a phenomena of nature, then the laws of nature apply to us. And the idea of that we have a certain dignity that should be respected was not really seen as intelligible. So you had 
an alternative view that we weren't just merely part of this ongoing eternal cosmos, but the cosmos was created as an act of free will by a creator, a personal creator. And this was the biblical view. And the human beings were created in the image of that creator. So instead of an eternal cosmos in deep, the cyclical laws of nature determining the cosmos and fatalism and determinism being the fundamental principles of, in which the cosmos operated and we're just part of this cosmic drama. They seen human beings as created in the image of a creator. So this creativity in human free will, because we're endowed by our creator, we're, we're an endowment, if, he, if our creator is, a, is cr created, he is creative. And therefore we are created beings and, we, and, if the, and if the creation was an act of free will, we have, we are endowed with free will. So this is, it made this, what do you do about slavery? What do you do? A lot of, there's a lot of problems. What do you do about the equal, unequal treatment of women? What do you do, you know, if, if there is this dignity, if there is a dignity of the human person that comes from us in um, bearing the mark of our creator, then we can't talk seriously about creating a city on a hill where the eyes of the world are upon us, or creating a new order for the ages where we're gonna bring about what Jefferson referred to as an empire of liberty. We're gonna be an example for the world. And they, they didn't believe in creating a world parliament or a UN or anything like that. They believed in voluntary associations brought to the international level um, that would, government play very limited role and enforce locally, but you had Volunt communications, and you had, as commerce started to spread, you had the communication of ideas for commerce, and they saw the spread of commerce and the spread of ideas and values as part of the same issue. So I want to take a look at this um, idea about the individual being the um, in created in the image of God. This was now without trying to get overly religious. I, I, this worldview is very important because it t goes to the heart of the, of the nature of the human person. Are we mere phenomena of nature that the laws of the jungle, kill or be killed, apply to, or are we have a dignity that is somewhat quasi-divine? In other words, God created us in his image, so there is a divine image within human beings. That question makes a huge difference how we answer that question and how we treat one another and how we look at things like slavery. And this, it doesn't get enough play in our history classes at any level of education, but this, this understanding of the dignity of the human person played a very large role in the abolition of slavery and bringing, bringing about the um, national liberation movements and so, this, the dignity of the human person. So the, the human beings were supposedly be able to relate to our creator, the creator being infinite. And, the, and so therefore our need to relate, we, we are biologically hardwired. And this is, if you, neuro, neuroscience, there's a scientific report that was put out called Hardwired to Connect. And this is a scientific affirmation of a religious notion. Human beings are biologically hardwired to connect to a transcendent source of moral and spiritual meaning and to a community that is gonna help them live out that meaning. So transcendent source of moral, well, that's our creator. Um, that's a scientific affirmation of the re religious worldview. Now, it's not religion in a sense of Christian, Jewish, in a sectarian sense. Religion in this sense means to relate to a transcendent origin. Reli the, the, particularly in biblical, biblical religion, the defining principle of biblical religion is the human being has the ability to transcend their condition. We go beyond ourselves and we enter into a relationship with a being that transcends the, rule, the, the cyclical laws of nature. And that's where human free will comes into, is this relationship to the creator. And the, the um, power of love is what drives the um, eros, what is what drives this relationship between, it's the jet fuel that produces the rocket that's gonna, 
allow the human being to transcend our natural limits and re relate to a transcendent source of moral and spiritual meaning. As so, our need for for love and to give and to receive love is infinite, and it can only be can only be satisfied ultimately by this transcendent source. And as according to the neuroscience, some of the neuroscientists, we are biologically hardwired to connect to a, such, to a transcendent source of moral and spiritual meaning. So, as mentioned in the Bible, this is um, St. Paul in Romans, when he's talking about the whole creation, the whole universe, the whole creation, God's presence was evident through the things he had made through his creation. So you felt this presence, but people did not recognize it as a presence, so they worshiped the crea creation rather than the creator. Now, the creation has got a divine spark, but it, it is a manifestation of the creator. The creation itself is temporal, and, there, and it's not infinite, therefore, or not transcendent. So therefore, by in and of itself, it doesn't have the ability to wholly satisfy that need. It is satisfying to a certain extent, but the ultimate need of relationship is to something transcendent. And according to St. Paul, in the biblical um, book of Romans, the problem lies when we start to feel that spark of divine spark within nature and we see that divinity coming as strictly within nature itself and we don't relate it to the transcendent and so therefore our passions are aimed at something temporal that by its death the temporal and finite is incapable of quenching those passions so the passions are you've got these unquenchable passions that are being aimed at something that's incapable by itself of quenching it and so you got an addiction and you become a slave to those passions. And so you have this battle. Then he, he talks about the, your mom, we became a slave to our passions so our minds became darkened. And so there, there is a, a lot of, in biblical um, worldview, there's a, a lot of imagery of light and darkness. Light symbolizes the presence of God and darkness symbolizes like the eclipse, of the, the lack of that presence. And the darkness creates a like an it's almost like an addiction. You've got an itch you can't scratch. You got and you're looking for love in all the wrong places. Now it's not wrong to love think you know, the creation, other people and stuff like that, but to expect ultimate satisfaction from a finite thing is not going to satisfy you. And so it's cause a distortion in human nature. And then the problem, a lot, psych, um, a lot of your psychiatrists and your neuroscientists are starting to recognize that a lot of our mental health issues come from a breakdown of those connections between of the transcendent source of moral and spiritual meaning, and to this community that's going to pass on this. So you have a society that will, that as the society becomes more secularized, the in, because institutional religion sometimes can become corrupt. So we we throw the baby out with the bathwater and you reject the religious transcendent impulse with it and the society um, becomes <coughs> so there's a, a, in, in its backlash it doesn't recognize the transcendent and so people you have no connection with the transcendent and you've become addicted to your passions and that addiction plays out in drug addiction and violence and all kinds of other things. So this is, this is um, the basic idea. And so there's, according to the biblical worldview, there's a struggle between light and darkness, between enlightenment and ignorance, between slavery and freedom, between the, all, the, the forces of light and forces of darkness, between good and evil. And you have supposedly um, religion, particularly according to the Bible, the biblical religion is called, people are called out to enter into the struggle on behalf of God to bring about the um, restoration of God's ideal. Now, the Jewish people, they created a temple in Jerusalem. And it, where God's presence could dwell and they worship the temple and they want to restore that link between God and man that was lost 
And so they have this temple in Jerusalem, and that's the key to the Jewish religion. So and then the struggle for some people, and this is not just in Judaism too, this is in a lot of other religions, the struggle became between the forces of good and the forces of darkness became, this is, this is a for, these people are the forces of good and these people are the forces of darkness. And sometimes you got into a conflict and it's an us versus them and it can create problems. Now, the Christianity came out of what is referred to as Second Temple Judaism. Out of that, from the book of Ezekiel, the Jews, the, we pick up the situation where the Israelite people were um, driven out of the Babylon captivity. They were captive by the Babylonians and they were driven out of it, taken from um, Israel and they were captive in Babylon. And then Ezekiel, the prophet, this is revelation from God. This, he envisions God the way you would expect him to be in the temple. And the first thing he's struggling with is, how is it possible that God's presence is in Babylon? And I mean, the, we don't have the temple with us. And this is, you know, is supposed to be at the temple back in Jerusalem. And then he come, Jews from that point, this is referred to when they came back, when they came back to return and created the temple again, the second temple of Judaism. Some of them, were impacted by this, the vision that Ezekiel had. And they realized that God's presence could be with somebody re regardless of where they are, even in Babylon, which was like a city shrouded in darkness. And so they started to realize that the individual believer was actually the temple. And the, the actual physical temple was symbolic. And so the, if that's true, then that the forces of light is and, and you got this, there's a struggle going on and, and it started to develop this idea that the forces of light and the forces of darkness go through each individual person it's not us and them and the, we're the forces of light and they're the forces of darkness no but there's a struggle within each human heart and this um, struggle is going to end in an apocalypse the apocalypse where God is reveals himself now, a lot of people interpret the apocalypse in the military victory in where the forces of good and the forces of evil meet. And like in the book of Revelation, they meet in, in the Battle of Armageddon. They have this military conflict. But certain traditions in, uh, within Christianity, and this is the, um, the, the, uh, the um, Quakers picked up on this, and that's why I refer to this apocalypse of the word. It's the, is the, the word of God through, through Christ within you is what they're looking for, not a, a coming of a military conqueror. So this is, I want to get back, this tradition within Christianity that came from the, what they call Johannian tradition in some of Paul's writings, but it basically focuses upon the indwelling presence of Christ within rather than bureaucratic institutions and the mediation of religious leaders and stuff like that. So this caused a lot of division within the church because people didn't want, to, didn't want to submit to authority because we got the light of God within us, the light of Christ within us. And brotherly love, we don't need an institutional authority to do that. And that tradition was picked up and impacted in English Christianity. And you, so you had you had a lot of, you had Baptists and Quakers and you had Presbyterian. You had so many different denominations and, and some, they're coming over to America and you have even more. And you're wondering, my God, there's like, it's every, it seems like every few minutes you get a new denomination. Well, why is that? And that's because they believe the human being, the individual human being is a temple of God. And so some of them were very um, reluctant to submit themselves to human authority. And so it had its good points and its bad points. And this viewpoint of the, and the Quakers picked it up in the extreme. There was, um, the, the Puritans did to a certain extent. Jonathan Edwards wrote this, probably the most sophisticated um, writing on the idea of the, the inner light within was Jonathan Edwards' Divine and Supernatural Light. And he wrote about that, but the Quakers picked this up and he said, they said that everything that is needed can be satisfied by 
the light of Christ within you and brotherly love between you. So this expression in everybody, this divine light is present within everybody, including slaves. So therefore, slavery is something that is absolutely out of the question. So they became very, advent, very adamant defenders of the rights of slaves. But at the same time, this new order for the ages wanted peace too. So they, didn't, they actually didn't believe in fighting a war to overcome this. They believed that this was apocalypse. These were the last days where God is gonna reveal himself, but God is gonna reveal himself through his word internally and that, 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 that we're going to fight this battle of good versus evil, but that's, that battle is going on within the human heart. And this is, so, so they believed that, and they didn't believe in what they call carnal means to spiritual ends. If you want a spiritual end, you need a spiritual means. So they believed that the, the battle should be strictly on spiritual and moral grounds, and they thought that they would, we would compromise our values if we whatever victory we won by military means would eventually be short-lived because it wouldn't change the heart so they wanted to end slavery but they also wanted to end war and they had they had this viewpoint now some people well doesn't we have in revelations you have the the, the battle of armageddon you got these people are are um gearing for a battle and so we have today Christians, some Christians believe, a lot of them believe, that in the latter days you're going to have this physical battle. But if you look at that, there's a whole series of to him who overcomes, I will give to eat of the manna. That's overcoming is to keeping the commandments. And then they, if you look through many of these verses, you get to the point where Christ is getting ready to go into into battle, but he's and he's covered with blood. And this is but this is before the battle starts, and the the um, the blood was his own. So in other words, what they're arguing here, this battle, he uh, he wins by self-sacrifice. He who seeks to gain his life will lose it. He who seeks to lose his life will gain it. So they don't believe that all of a sudden the our battle of Armageddon is going to be won by carnal means. So the the um, and this this is something we might want to consider today when we talk when we deal with we have situations we have today in a you got injustice and you got problems you got struggle that's going on in the, in the world and we have jihad for the Islam. Then you got some people, some sects of Judaism are getting ready for a military battle to defend Israel. And you got some sections of Christianity who are getting ready to prepare for the last days for the battle of Armageddon. Now, these religious organizations, if there should be advocates of peace, and not part of the push towards violence. So we might want to consider whether it be um, in, in, in the Jewish tradition, whether it be in the, in the, the uh, Christian tradition, or whether it be in the Islamic tradition, that this battle of good versus evil is a battle that goes through the human heart and is a battle of, for the, the light of Christ within. And this, this is, um, this commitment, this obsession that the Quakers had made them world changers. They played an outsized role compared to their large size of their population in the abolitionist movement and a lot of the movements for women's liberation, for all these other kinds of justice movement. And the, um, you, look, you look at in the Jewish tradition, you, um, King David was a messianic figure, but he wasn't the one that, his, his son Solomon was the one that had to, to create the temple because the Lord didn't let David create the temple, build the temple because he had too much blood on his hands, too many, too many from too much 
fighting. And then the, um, the, the, in the Islamic tradition, there is external, the greater jihad and the lesser jihad. And so there's, there's particularly if you listen to the thinkers from Nata'ula Ulama, which is uh, the conference of this largest Islamic group in the world, the Muslim group in the world, they are over in Indonesia. They have a similar interpretation of the notion of jihad. And there's, in Christianity, you have a group called the Voice of the Martyrs. There's been more, starting, well, 21st century hasn't finished yet, so, but we'll look at the 20th century. There were more martyrs in the 20th century in Christianity than the previous 19 combined. And the, the growing, the fastest growing movement of, within Christianity, probably in the world itself, are these Pentecostal spiritualist movements that are in the global south. China, underground church in China, and places like that, and you, over in the Middle East and stuff. A lot of these are underground, they're persecuted, and they're getting, they're, 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 they're undergoing martyrdom, and you know, people are trying to mow them down, and they're growing like weeds, you can't. It's like Tertullian, a second century church thinker, once said that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And so they're conquering, but they're not conquering by military might, they're conquering by their faith, and they're being martyred, and they're being, um, persecuted in vile ways, but they're not succumbing to a military um, violent or a political approach yet anyway. And I think it is people like that, that that I am reminded of when I read in Revelation, when they keep referring to, to those who overcome. I think it's those who live by the admonition, he who lives by the sword shall die by the sword. Or he who gain, gains his life will lose it, and he who loses his life will gain it. I think in the latter, that, is, that doesn't change in the latter days. And I think we might want to take a serious look at interpreting the, um, some of the events in Revelation a little bit more symbolically and a little bit more in carefully in context with what went before it. And not all okay, Christ overcome by self-sacrifice now is going to become a military dictatorship. I don't think so. And I, 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 I think, you know, that goes against the general trend that you're going to see from Genesis all the way forward. So I, I, I say that because if we're going to overcome jihadism and a lot of these other things, then we have to set a better example. And that is, and that, whether it be our Jewish brethren in Israel, our Muslim brother, brethren in Indonesia who don't believe in jihad, jihad as a military battle, or those Christians who are being martyred all over the world for, um, and keep into this tradition. Now, I think as we move forward and, True, a true global age will come about through a moral reformation. I, 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 I think that the um, individual dignity that comes with being, believing one is created in the heart, in, in the image of the creator, will cause the kind of individual initiative and creativity that brings forward new technology. You don't have to, in order to adhere to traditional values, you don't have to give up on individual creativity and vice versa. So I, I, do, I do think a moral reformation rather than, in, rather than a revive in the United Nations is the key to this. Thank you very much and we'll see you next month.